All right, uh, hello everybody. Uh, we're here to talk to you today about uh, our journey through uh, getting the Open Tofu registry up and running. <laughs> uh, it's been a long process and hopefully we'll take you through all of the steps. Uh, but just to get things started first, um, my name is James Humphreys. I'm a software engineer at Spacelift and I'm an Open Tofu core engineer. I've been around in the Open Tofu project since day number one. And, and I'm Errol. I've also been in Open Tofu since day number one, and I'm a principal engineer in M0. So let's get started. We have a lot to go through. Uh, first of all, I'll give you a bit of background on the start of Open Tofu. Uh, we started off as a fork of Terraform, some pre 1.6.0 version of it. And we had a bunch of stuff we had to get going. Uh, we had to stabilize work in, uh, in progress features, like the testing feature uh, that was new at the time. We had to fix some bugs and crashes that were in the testing feature mainly during that time and uh, remove a lot of uh, potential tra trademark violations of Terraform for obvious reasons. Well, uh, that should have been very straightforward. At least that's what we thought, because later we found out that Terraform registry has changed its terms of service. Uh, now it can all be used with or in support of HashiCorp Terraform, and we are not HashiCorp Terraform, so we're in a bit of a pickle. So we had to create our own registry. Now, uh, most of you here probably know what a Terraform or OpenTofu registry is if you're using Terraform or OpenTofu, but I'll give you a quick rundown anyway. It's basically a catalog of providers and modules. Providers and modules are the main building blocks of, uh, ter of Terraform and TF configuration in general. And uh, uh, Terraform and OpenTofu can't function without that. They need providers and modules for every TF configuration you have. You're prob if you're using AWS, whatever, you're using the registry. So that's a very important part of Terraform and OpenTofu. Uh, when you run Terraform in it or OpenTofu in it, uh, that's when you contact and com communicate with the registry and you download the providers and modules that you need. And if you've ever had issues with your providers or modules, you probably know that the implementations are in public GitHub repositories. And for every new version, there's a release. That's how they manage versions for providers and modules. Now, for how the registry works behind the scenes, there's an API called the V1 API that it implements. It has four endpoints, two for listing versions for modules and providers, and two for getting download information uh, for a specific version of a provider or module. So when Terraform CLI or OpenTofu CLI uh, decides that it needs a specific provider or module, it first of all asks what are the available versions and gets back the available versions. And when it decides, okay, this is the specific version that I need of the provider or module, it asks for download information of that provider or module and gets back a download URL from the registry. So that's basically a quick round of how it would work. Now we'll talk about the alpha registry. Yep, so uh, we call it the alpha registry because it was what we wanted to really get started with and we knew we were gonna throw part of this away. So we realized really quickly that we had a couple of requirements for this alpha registry uh, to get things going. So we first off, we wanted to get started immediately. We realized we had to move quickly. We wanted to be making sure that we can get a release of Tofu Owl and into the hands of people because people really wanted to be moving over and testing it. So to get us going, we decided to take a two-pronged approach. We started off with getting the alpha registry set up first, and this was a quick and hacky solution, which I'm going to talk you through, and you'll realize how quick and hacky it was. Uh, and then uh, alongside that, we wanted to take all of our learnings from the alpha registry, take that, work with the community, and build our stable registry, which is what we're using today. So we had a couple of requirements. Uh, a drop-in replacement is what we were aiming for and what we kept saying throughout OpenTofu, and uh, hopefully you'll see that we achieved this. Um, but we wanted people to come along and just run Tofu in it on their existing projects. We didn't want people to have to go and make code changes. We didn't want people to have to worry about how do I migrate. People should be able to come along and use Tofu out of the box with no problem. Our next uh, requirement, sorry, was that it had to handle the load of the OpenTofu usage. We know that for every single provider, every single run that's going on, there's a lot of HTTP requests and we have to handle all of those. So we wanna make sure that our alpha registry isn't gonna fall over because if we go and do a fork and release it and no one can use it, it's no good. Uh, 
but we wanted to make sure that it was there and ready for everyone to use. So to go into detail about the alpha registry a little bit, uh, we dove in deep with AWS because it's what we know and what we, what we use. Uh, and we tried to keep it as simple as possible because we, uh, our focus was to move fast. So we set up one AWS Lambda, which handled all of our API requests. These are the four requests that Arrow was talking about earlier. And then we uh, threw an API gateway in front of it. We preemptively tried to cache as much as we could because we realized a lot of people are requesting the same data. A lot of people love the AWS provider, but not many people are using it to manage their Spotify playlists or anything like this. So this was working really well. We were handling a lot of requests very cheap and very quickly. And once we got through all of this, we hit an issue. We were talking over to GitHub every single time someone made one of these API requests, and we were quickly getting rate limited. 5,000 requests is what GitHub gives us, and that was not enough for the load that we were doing. We were quickly falling over, and it was taking down the registry a lot. So it, everything was working until it didn't, and so we panicked, and we added in caching. We threw in an API gateway between ourselves, our Lambda, and the uh, GitHub re repository. And what this allowed us to do was cache every request that we're doing to GitHub. We're doing a lot of the same requests and we wanted to make sure that we're not wasting our API uh, rate limit because that's a very precious resource. And that was working really well. <laughs> And this is a common theme in this section of the alpha registry where we'd fix one thing and another thing would pop up and we're just moving bottlenecks all over the place. We were hitting API Lambda timeouts. People were requesting the API provider. We were trying to talk to GitHub and fetch information about every one of its 232 releases. And GitHub doesn't like having a fast API. So what did we do? We added in more caching. We <laughs> We implemented a uh, document DB store where we would, every time somebody makes a request, we try and serve that information as quickly as possible and store it away in a document DB. We realized that we can dump this data and serve it back up for another hour. We've implemented our own version of caching and we're simplifying things. And we also introduced uh, another Lambda here, which may seem a little bit confusing, but we were asynchronously um, doing updates. So any time a user came in and requested a version of our provider, we'd also tell our other Lambda, hey, go and update document DB if we need to. And this meant sure that, made sure that what we were doing was great. But as you've all probably preempted, caching is difficult and cache invalidation is one of the biggest problems in programming as always. So we were hitting problems where GitHub's API would fail for one of our few requests. And all of a sudden, a version of the AWS provider wasn't available. A version of the Cloud Posse deep merge module wasn't available. And all of a sudden, people couldn't use Tofu 100% of the time. It was down for five seconds every hour, and I wasn't very happy with that. We weren't very happy with that. So. It was good enough. It got us going. It got us working with an alpha release. Uh, I believe once we got through and we were releasing to alpha, we got to a point where we were hitting maybe one issue a day for 30 seconds. Uh, it's not the uptime that I would like, but it was good enough and we got it working really quickly. But we took away some of these learnings. We made sure that we, we knew we had to keep it simple. We didn't want to keep adding lambdas. We didn't want to keep adding uh, caching in different places. We didn't want to keep adding to the situation. We wanted to try and simplify our process. And then we also realized that we had to make it, make it work along with how OpenTofu worked. We've inherited this code. We've inherited how it talks to the registry. And we want to make sure that we're doing things in the right kind of way. And low maintenance. Aral and I and other OpenTofu core members were spending all of our time looking in AWS X-Ray, looking in cloud, uh, CloudWatch, trying to figure out why a certain request was failing. And we didn't want to do this anymore. It's not that we don't love debugging and firefighting. We do. <laughs> but it's something that we can't keep doing. And especially when we're an open source community, uh, we are full-time engineers working on the Open Tofu project, but our time is really valuable. We've got a website to run. We've got a CLI to add features to. And we've got to prioritize our time. So this is where we came into picking a stable design. Alongside all of this work on the alpha registry that we were doing, we were trying to make sure that we had a stable design ready for our implementation. This was our V2. We wanted to take that alpha and throw it away. So we took everything that we learned. We went out to the community and started asking for uh, RFCs, uh, requests for comments. And 
this was a great process. We went out to our Slack community, uh, which you should all join. I'll put a link at the end. Uh, and we went out to everyone in general saying, hey, we would like to talk to the community about how to best do this design. We're all smart people, but we're aware that there's thousands of smart people in the community as well, and we would be silly to ignore any solutions that they come to us with. So, uh, at the end of this process, we decided that we should let the Technical Steering Committee decide. Now, the Technical Steering Committee is something you might hear thrown around with OpenTofu. It's a board of some of the founding members of the OpenTofu project. So, from each of the people who are submitting uh, full-time engineers, a lot of the projects uh, who are involved, uh, and we have a board of members who make decisions. So, we put it out. We put out a request. Myself and one of my co-workers, Kuba, ended up uh, putting in uh, two different requests here. Uh, we ended up getting uh, an external contribution from an uh, existing registry called TerraReg. Uh, and we were also talking to another member of the CNCF called uh, Artifact Hub to try and figure out if we could piggyback on some of their existing uh, infrastructure and pr um, providers and things like this. They offer uh, Helm charts. So. When we got to it at the end of the day, uh, we ended up deciding, and the technical steering committee ended up deciding as well, on working with a homebrew-like registry design. Uh, and this was King. And just to talk you through a little bit of background on homebrew and what it is, I'll pass over to RL. Yeah, so I'll talk a bit, first of all, about the inspiration I had for this uh, issue, this RC uh, homebrew. Uh, first of all, is anyone here using Mac OS? Do you know homebrew? <laughs> yeah, okay, not enough hands, but good enough. Um, yeah, so I'll give a quick rundown of, of what Homebrew is. Uh, it's basically a package manager for macOS. It's a very popular one. Uh, you can use it to download uh, pretty much any package or binary you would like. For, so, for example, if you'd like to use OpenTofu, you can just use brew, install OpenTofu, and it will download and install OpenTofu for you. Yeah, that's it. That's Homebrew. Now. How does it work behind the scenes? Well, Homebrew pretty much has its own registry, kind of. Uh, it has the Homebrew core public repository that has all of the formulas there. Uh, you can see the formula folder there. If we click on that, we will see a bunch of folders, uh, mostly single letters, which are the first letters of the binary you would like to use. For in, in our case, it's O, and you'll find OpenTofu RB there. Now, um, one point regarding these folders. Uh, uh, we talked to the homebrew project lead, he actually commented on the issue for the RFC itself and told us why they did that. It's mainly for better Git performance uh, in case of projects with a huge Git history. So that was very helpful when they talked to us about that. We actually did the same thing and you'll see that in a minute. So uh, let's take a look at what's inside the OpenTofu RB file. It's mainly just metadata that you need in order to download uh, the OpenTofu binary. Uh, it doesn't have, it contained the binary itself, it just redirects, there's a URL for the uh, artifact in the GitHub releases. So that's all there is there. Um, now, Homebrew only manages the latest version of binary, so what happens when there's a new version coming in? Well, you can bump it up, you run a brew bump formula PR command with, you provide the tag and the binary, and it creates a GitHub PR for you, uh, changing the Ruby file according to the new information, your checksums and everything that needs to change. Um, yeah, so that's it regarding homebrew, uh, what I really liked about this is the clarity and open source nature of it. Everyone can see when a formula was added and when it was changed and why via PRs, which is what the entire community knows uh, how to look at. So uh, we really like that. And adding a new, um, a new formula would be via PR as well. Uh, people would be, it would be pretty easy for the community to add new formulas. Uh, we did want to streamline that a bit more. We will talk about that in a second. And something we could not do ourselves would have this brew bump formula PR um, version for providers or modules. There are a ton of versions all the time. Uh, we have a bunch of providers and modules. We couldn't expect the community or people to run these commands whenever there's a new version coming up. So uh, we couldn't do that. So now let's talk about the actual stable registry design that we ended up with. Um, it had four parts. First of all, uh, it had uh, 
repository folder structure pretty similar to what we had in Homebrew. Uh, we had uh, JSON files containing metadata for the provider and module ver and versions, and uh, each version uh, you have metadata that I'll talk about uh, in a second. And uh, we had to run a one-off hydration uh, to have all of the existing providers and modules there. Uh, we use GitHub Search API and uh, Google BigQuery for that. You can take a look at the PRs we had with the hydration to see, to have more info on how we did that. And okay, now that we have the JSON files, we had to get new versions. So we had to periodically update uh, the existing JSON files with new versions. Um, after that, uh, the V1 API, we ended up not having a V1 API. We ended up mimicking it with hosting static files. Uh, you'll see that again in one minute. And uh, for adding a new provider or module, all you had to do uh, was create a PR, but we decided to simplify that a bit more. So for the folder structure, you can see it's pretty similar to Homebrew. We have the modules and providers folders here. If you'd like to go to integration slash GitHub provider, for example, you have to go to providers and then I integrations, and then you find github.json there. And the github.json file has all of the metadata you would need. It contains all of the versions and for each version, all supported OSs and architectures and the checksums for each release for each of those. Uh, so again, like Homebrew, it doesn't contain the binaries themselves. It contains download URLs and all of the necessary data uh, to get those binaries. They are mainly hosted on GitHub uh, release artifacts. Now for version bumping, uh, we decided to go with uh, scheduled GitHub actions. Uh, what we liked about that is this is very visible to the community. The community could take a look and see, okay, the new version is not here yet. It's going to be there in 10 minutes, for example, or they can actually see if a version bump process failed and notify us about that. So uh, that's something we really liked about that, the open source nature of it. Uh, we use some heuristics to not hit the GitHub API rate limit that you saw earlier in the graphs. Uh, and I'll talk about that soon. And that what, that's what helped us scrape around 30,000 repositories every hour, uh, which we do right now every hour. Um, yeah, so that's how we did that. For modules, instead of relying on releases, uh, we could just rely on the tags. So we ran git commands, uh, specifically git ls remote, and we get all of the tags for all of the modules. And if there's a new one, we rebuild the JSON file with the new versions. Now for providers, we did have to rely on releases. So uh, we went to uh, GitHub releases RSS feed and tried to check for each provider if there's a new version. And only if there was one, then we called GitHub API to get the release and rebuild the JSON file. So that's how we went from a, thousand, a couple thousand requests uh, each hour to just a few dozen. Um, yeah, so that's how we periodically build the JSON files. So, uh, on the back of that one, please don't tell GitHub that we're circumventing their API request rate limits. We're yeah. doing the best we can <laughs> to try and uh, don't talk about that one. So, um, we had to go and implement those four different API v1 calls that we had uh, described at the start of the registry. So, we're fetching the module and the provider versions, and then fetching a download link for each of those individual ones. So, um, we wanted to make sure that all of the data we're storing, going back to what we were talking about as a requirement, it was simple. So we realized that we can serve all of this data statically. If we can take all of the metadata that we're storing in GitHub and turn it into these JSON files that Ariel's describing, we can serve everything statically 100% from Cloudflare R2. Now Cloudflare R2, we're really thankful for. Uh, they are a business sponsor of ours, and so they've given us everything, but you can completely take our registry. We're working with it right now, and it sits 100% in the free tier. Uh, and we're currently handling like f hundreds of gigabytes of data coming through this. Uh, so we're really thankful for Cloudflare R2, but we made sure that everything was static. We have no compute going on here. We're really simplifying everything down to just serving files. 
So, for example, if you want to go and fetch the integrations GitHub that Arrow mentioned earlier, uh, you can go and request this. And we're not quite sure if this is a URL or a folder path. It's because they both match. Uh, what we're doing is we're, we're creating a directory structure that matches the API that we're doing. We're mimicking an actual API. But what we're really doing is we're just serving up static data. We have no compute, no complexity. We just leave everything up to Cloudflare to serve a bucket. So... For each of these uh, modules or providers, we'll create a, a set of files. We'll create one versions file, and this maintains like a list of all of the versions, operating systems, and architectures that we support for that provider or module. Uh, and then for each of those versions, we'll create individual download links. Uh, and what this means is we've got a lot of files being generated from the metadata that we're going through. We, we got, what did you say, almost 30,000 providers and modules. Yeah. So for each of those, they can have hundreds of releases. We're creating a lot of files here. Um, and then we host it all in R2. R2 is, again, free egress. Like, go and use them. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to pay as much as AWS want to charge you. Um, so as you can see here, we have our uh, two GitHub actions at the top. One is to go and generate all of that data. This takes about 10 minutes, to go, and we're running this hourly. Uh, and that generates all of these JSON files and stores them. And then we take another 10 minutes to go and sync it all up to R2. We're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of files. So we have to make sure that we're specifically only uploading those that change. Because otherwise, it, I think our initial hydration was like two hours to go and get it all up there. It costs a bit of money to go and upload it. And we don't want to be hitting that every time. So we're trying to be smart about what we're uploading. Um, if you want to go and add a new module or provider, we hydrated our registry initially with 30,000 different items, roughly. Uh, but there are new modules and providers being created all the time, and we can't keep scanning GitHub because they're going to hate us. Uh, so uh, if you want to go and add your own module or provider to our registry, it's really simple. You just need to go and create a pull request to go and add your uh, to the registry. So to do this, you can go to our registry. We've automated everything for you. Go to our registry repository and you can create a new issue. There'll be one of two templates there, a provider or a module. There's also some other templates if you've got issues or anything you want to raise. But these are the main two that people are going to be using. And we ask you to fill in a super complicated form of two fields. <laughs> we just want to look at your GitHub repository and where it is. If you want to add a provider to the repository that you're not an author of, that's perfectly fine. If it's public and on GitHub, we're going to go bring it into our registry so you can use it. Um, what this means is there's a low barrier of entry. Coming along and adding your stuff to open tofu is a much, much simplified process. If you wanna, uh, once, once you've added that and you created that issue, we have a bunch of automation that happens under the hood. We'll go and check that this provider has a bunch of releases. It is an actual Terraform provider repository. Um, it's got releases that are valid. It's not trying to be malicious by swapping some GPG keys around and things like this. We're trying to do our best that we can to validate these providers before they come into our registry. But this is all automated. It takes about five seconds to run anytime someone creates the issue. The only thing you're going to be gated by is that right now is a human merging those PRs. We, for security reasons, we don't want people misusing the registry. There still requires a human to hit that merge button at the end. Uh, but we're getting dozens a day, uh, dozens a week, sorry, and we can handle this load perfectly fine for now. So where are we today? We have been really great in uh, everything that we've designed and it's really paid off. So we're serving hundreds of gigabytes of data and we're hitting uh, Cloudflare's cache at like 99.9%. Uh, we are handling all of the load perfectly fine. We've had people load testers and uh, get blocked by Cloudflare. And if Cloudflare is gonna block you before we do, then I'm really happy with that. Um, We've had dozens of contributions. We've had people come in and add their module to the registry. We've had people go to their providers and say, hey, can you add to the Open Tofu registry? And it's there in five minutes, 10 minutes, because it's super quick to do. We were, we're successfully a drop-in replacement. We are super happy today to say that you can come along, take your existing Terraform code, and just run Tofu in it, and it works perfectly fine. You are not going to be hitting the HashiCorp registry. You are not going to be uh, abusing their terms of service, and they can't chase someone down. I'm not a lawyer. Please don't come after me or talk to me about this. Um, but the main thing is this is a drop-in replacement. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so migration is super easy. Just come along, take your existing code. You know code changes needed. Just run Tofu in it. So takeaways from all this stable registry and where we're at. 
Community-driven design. This was super important to go and get all the community's input. Uh, as Aaron mentioned earlier, we had the homebrew uh, core contributor uh, get in touch with us and give us some advice about how to host things in GitHub. We had multiple people from across the existing ecosystem of providers, provider um, registries that are already existing for private, and they all came to us and started talking about how we can do things, and we've ended up with a great design. We really can't go wrong. Um, maximum visibility. If you want to go and say, hey, where's my provider? You can go and check if it's there in GitHub. You can go and see if the file's been added, when it was added, when the versions were updated, when it was synced up to our, our registry. There's full visibility, and this helps people debug all of their issues. To this day, we've, we're very rarely having issues. I think we're at a total of three, and the biggest impact was that something was an hour late. So I'm really happy with that. Um, maintenance. Maintenance cost has been zero. We have had this running now for a few months, and we have had zero issues, like we say, just one issue where someone's uh, provider was an hour late. We've put no development time into this, and this is really important because as we're a small team of an open source community, we have to make sure that our developer time is put into things like adding features to open tofu that you guys want state encryption and stuff is coming soon mm -hmm. <laughs> we've got a website to run we've got a lot of pull requests and issues to come in and we've got to triage them and we've got to say that our time is really valuable and simplicity is key this is the fun part all of this design all of our alpha registry learnings this meant that we could go and make this registry in a week we wrote some simple code it's I think it's under a thousand lines now. We wrote it in a week, it's publicly visible, and it just works, and we're really happy. So, what's next for the registry? We are looking at adding a user interface for our registry. Right now, we don't have one, and HashiCorp does, and we don't like that. Uh, so, uh, we want to make sure that people can go and read the provider documentation, their module documentation through a user interface. And we're looking to go through that same design process. It was successful before, and we're hoping it's going to be successful again. So, we're looking forward to the community giving us some contributions about how we can do a registry user interface. We've already had a couple community members who are working on like proof of concepts, uh, and we're really happy to go and see all this unfold. So uh, if you do have anything you want to go and see, you can go and look up our uh, repository, opentofu slash registry, raise some issues, have a poke around, or submit an RSC for how you want the design to be. So uh, the CNCF has asked us to add a QR code here. If you want to go give us feedback, you can scan this. Uh, and we'd be amiss if we didn't mention that you can join our opentofu Slack uh, over here with this QR code as well. We've got over 1,500 members. It's a very active community, and we'd love to have you all there. Uh, Thank you. You're Fantastic. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have time for questions or? Okay. Yes. Any questions, anybody? Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, does it uh, support right now module signing, verification of uh, modules? The registry or is there any plan to support uh, that so right now there isn't a mechanism to go and check the signatures of modules mm -hmm. because modules under the hood work as just cloning a git repo mm -hmm. and so what we're doing is we're trusting the git repository uh there to work under the hood i believe there's an issue open if not i'll go and open one right now and we can go and discuss it uh but uh, we are currently supporting uh signing for providers so if you are already signing your providers with a gpg key uh, in the same process that I mentioned about adding a provider and a module, there's also a form for uploading a, GP, a public GPG key, uh, and it's all automated and works perfectly fine. If your module or provider is either missing from the registry or the GPG key is missing and someone runs Tofu in it, there's a nice little help message that says you can go and submit this here, and uh, hopefully that pushes people to go and do this because we're looking forward to the, the world where everyone's uploaded all of their keys and everything's super secure and there's no man in the middle of tax or anything like this. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I think there was another one. We have a couple. We'll have to get through this quickly. Yeah. Good morning, guys. Thank you for all the work, by the way. Um, are there any plans to support anything other than GitHub? For example, GitLab? Or are they the um, enemy? Yeah, not right now. I, I didn't see any issues regarding that, but for now, no. I think you can raise an issue for that if you'd like on the re registry. Okay. But I think it's pretty standard right now. At least 30,000 uh, repositories are on GitHub right now. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. We, we, we can take a look at that if there's a need for that. We, we've discussed it and we can do it. It's just HashiCorp decided that everything had to be on GitHub. Git, GitLab is definitely not the enemy at all. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking to a couple of GitLab guys. They're great. Um, is, is the implementation compatible with other Git providers as long as they support the HTTP? Yeah, it, it is. We just need to uh, work, have different API requests. That, that's it. The, the registry itself still will be on GitHub, but we can request any data from wherever we want. So, yeah, it should work fine. Okay, thank you, guys. No problem. We have time for one or two more questions. Sebastian, there was <clears throat> one over here that was first, I think. Yeah. yeah. Right in the end. Run, run, run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we need to run. Thank you. So first of all, thanks for explaining how it works underneath also knowledge. Uh, one question is regarding the how the open TOEFL binary and this registry is coupled, because if I understand it correctly, it is the same like in the Terraform, so it is tightly coupled and there's no way to host or just create your own registry and point open TOEFL to your own registry. Are there any plans or decisions regarding that? Yeah, can go ahead. Yeah, so this is a really fun one uh, because I think other people want to be running the registry. Uh, I think Pepe, who spoke earlier, raised an issue about running the alpha registry. Uh, we want people to be able to run mirrors of our registry. We want people to be able to take this data and host it themselves somewhere if they want to. The fun part behind that is that we've inherited a large code base, and that large code base was maintained by HashiCorp, who hard-coded registry.terraform.io everywhere into their code base. Uh, we have an issue open about making a dynamic uh, registry, so we're hoping that you may be able to set either a piece of configuration or an environment variable where you can say, this is where my registry is, the default registry, and it fetches all of the providers and modules from there. Uh, and that would be great for going forward. There's a lot of people who like to run providers, uh, provider registries internally or privately, and we're hoping to target that. Um, awesome. Just one point about, about that. Uh, that was just for a default registry. Right now, if for every provider you define, you just write your own registry path, you can use a private registry if you'd like, and we aim for you to have, you could have our implementation for that or Terrareg or anything else. So it is possible right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly what I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right, um, one more question. Oh, we have time. Okay. Thank you. Um, now I think most of it is based on the Terraform registry API. Like, are you planning to f diverge a lot in any near future? Uh, it's a really well-documented API. And what we would like to say is that we we want to try and keep compatibility with Terraform as much as possible as well. Um, whilst the V1 API is great for downloading modules and providers, we are going to have to diverge. So HashiCorp has a V2 API, which um, powers their uh, documentation engine, their front end. Uh, and we're going to be looking at implementing our own version of that when we're looking at the registry UI, I think. So... We're trying our best not to diverge. We don't, our provider community is really important to us and uh, making it easy to move from Terraform to HashiCorp is really important and making sure that people can use private registries on top of this really well-documented V1 API is really important. So we're trying not to diverge where possible. We're trying to make sure everything's a drop-in replacement, as I've said a few times. Uh, hopefully people get the very liminal message. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we're trying to keep it as close as possible uh, where we can. There is there has been one small change with the registry and how we handle modules, but where, where possible, we're trying to keep it the same. Yeah. And then the, as the false said, at Atlantis said, it's really hard to know who's using what in the community. So uh, we have no idea if there are third party tools using that API. So we we're trying to be a bit cautious about that before we make any big breaking changes. Mm -hmm. We're And uh, if anyone wants any, if anyone wants any open tofu swag, uh, you can go find some at uh, Spacelift uh, at H24. It's on the, the things in front of you, or I think M Zero and Scalar also have swag around. Yeah. Go get open tofu T-shirts, stickers, and treat yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much.